very good morning and uh, we just sort of spending a couple of minutes waiting but i think we'll get started because luckily we have some audience here so so i'm very excited to bring in the national symposium of konya and this time the theme is what's new in in and around the year of 2020 and it's really exciting because after 2 years we all getting together and to see what's uh, current as well as what's latest we welcome dr maskati to officiate the proceedings as the chair and dr samar basak please come sir ek aur chair so we have seven talks in the session and uh, the talks are by really some of the giants i would say in the field of cornea india and international and with it's like a potpourri of what's happening in cornea so it's all cornea so if you only like ocular surface or only like something else then you'll be a little disappointed but you'll definitely be updated about what's happening and so the rules of the game are even if i am giving you the podium late but we'll going to end on time that's for sure and also uh, i would request that everybody try to maintain the time obviously and uh, unfortunately sometimes when you're speaking you can't really see the time over there uh, the speakers but there will be a board coming up saying you have 1 minute to go so you know where you're at so if you can just stay within the time limit so it's my uh, pleasure to very quickly introduce i think all the uh, people on the dais need no introduction So it's we'll okay leave it we we'll leave yeah. it at that it's yeah we'll it so we'll we we'll keep saying that everybody needs no introduction i think that's the best way yeah. so uh, the first speaker for the session is dr praveen krishna vadavali again needs no introduction uh, i think apart from him being an awesome surgeon with you know dmac and i don't think i've seen a better surgeon when he's doing that uh, his innovative capacity is immense and that's what he's going to talk to us about uh, innovations in cornea practice over to you praveen <laughs> thanks a lot uh, somshila thank you uh, for having me in this session and uh, mic is on uh, i thought i'll speak about a, a, a topic that is a little different from hardcore corneal surgery uh, that is going to be relevant uh, for several of us as practitioners not only in our clinics but also from the point of view of uh, managing patients who are uh, not proximal to us Uh, so just to introduce what i'm going to be talking about all of us are very aware of the eras that we have come to deal with uh, the pre covid era and the post covid era and this is something that seems to have taught us a lot of lessons uh, before uh, we actually confronted covid i think cornea surgeons were all uh, quite uh, uh, happy with the kind of luxury and the kind of instrumentation that you had at your disposal in your clinics uh and i think suddenly when we realize that you have a lot of patients who want an opinion but you do not have a lot of information about what is going on in their eye uh we started to figure out what we should do differently so what we tried to do as a goal is try to see if we can actually move a lot of our consults of our patients from physical consults to virtual consults to reduce the number of footfalls in the hospital uh not only during covid but also from the point of view of trying to create space to bring in more new patients in the future as well and this is something that is going to be sustainable not just for us but for all of you as well so what we did was we actually built a very rapid teleconsultation system that started with only a phone counselor that went on to a system uh, that had telecounselors that went on to a web based application and uh, right now we've been able to create a online mobile phone based system that actually is published uh, in the IGO as well last year one of our fears was the fact that we are not able to clear a lot of concerns of the patients but we found that uh, close to 95% of the patients were actually quite happy with the consultation on the phone uh so this is a system that actually uh this is how it looks it's on your mobile phone and you can actually consult and have your own appointment list for the patient but this is not the theme or the reason for the talk but this is just the background uh we did close to about 50000 teleconsults in the last year and a half uh and the most common teleconsults were in cornea but uh, we thought that with time because patients were coming from relatively far away across the country we also realized that we also need to measure visual acuity and so we also validated measuring visual acuity and this was published as well to find that uh, there are apps that you can measure visual acuity with quite accurately but the one thing that we were missing was to get information about the eye of the patient and though patients started taking photographs on their phones and sending us photographs 
we realized that these were quite variable depending on the kind of phone they had and also depending on the focus. And when we looked at these photographs, we found that only about 16% of these images were acceptable to clinicians from the point of view of making a decision. So we built a solution in-house which was a very small attachment to a mobile phone for follow-up care that could be used by a patient along with an app on the mobile phone that would help to position the eye and also to focus the eye so you could get better pictures. So with this, what happened was patients started sending us much better quality pictures and so we could actually treat even patients who had infections remotely and we could actually manage patients who had keratoplasty uh, by looking at their sutures and try to identify complications much earlier than what we normally would. So with this kind of system and all of these photographs that you see here are photographs that are captured on mobile phones with this system, we found that over 75% of the photographs that we obtained were utilizable from the point of view of making a clinical decision uh, for treatment. And this was great because it is a complete spectrum of patients from keratoprosthesis to infections as well that we started seeing online. The device went through a number of iterations. This is the uh, first iteration and that is the last iteration depending on the uh, kind of photographs that we were getting. And eventually now this is available as a product which every patient who has an infection, every patient who has a keratoplasty gets and the patient is supposed to share their pictures with the physician. What we found was we, uh, with this device, by creating more space in the clinic, we had a 10% increase in footfall uh, of new patients because of the fact that we could decongest clinics from follow-up patients as well. And this again was useful for the hospital system too. We also moved all our refractive surgery post-ops uh, online, so we don't see any of our refractive po surgery post-ops physically. And this obviously will create more space for you to see fresher patients or new patients for refractive surgery too. The next uh, iteration of what we are working on is uh, the telemedicine platform along with an app which actually will uh, automatically uh, take a photograph. This is called the Grabby Pro. This is in development, so I'm not allowed to show you the actual image of the device. Uh, but what this will do is this will automatically capture the uh, picture of the eye and upload it to the patient's file without the patient having to interact with the uh, device. And the quality of the photographs uh, have actually gone up quite significantly as well because this also has self-illumination. It also has blue light. So even patients who uh, or maybe practitioners are as well, uh, they can actually help identify epithelial defects as well with the blue light that is there on the device. The next iteration of the device is again something that we've built as a handheld device uh, which can actually take slit photographs. Uh, this is like a mobile slit uh, lamp. But again, it's attached to a, mo to a mobile phone. Uh, and this device can also be used for screening for patients who have cataract and also for patients who have any corneal uh, issues because patients can take a video or uh, somebody who is helping the patient can take a video of the slit on the cornea and you'll get a lot more information about what's going on in the cornea as well. Now, additional to this, we've also built a system that can be attached to a microscope and take photographs of microbiology slides. And we, are, uh, we have actually created a system where all of these can be connected to a central microbiologist who reads these uh, through the microscope using a video that is shared with them and they can give you a diagnosis of what the organism is, thus improving the effectiveness of uh, diagnostics as well as therapy for these kind of patients. And the reason why we actually need something like this is because if you look at the uh, prevalence of corneal specialists across India, you'll see that there are a lot of gaps in large rural areas. Most of us are present in the cities and this is going to become increasingly important for us to ensure that we reach our patients as well. We also set up systems to help uh, vision technicians in the remote rural areas to take photographs on uh, simple tabs attached to slit lamps and these were used to reduce the number of patients who are referred to the main hospital by close to 85%. Uh, so 85% of the patients who are seen at this setting were treated at the same setting without them having to travel to the main hospital as well. And this seems to be something that is very useful. There are a number of devices that are also available to look for visual fields as well as corneal topography and each of these devices actually are available at the booth if you want to go and have a look. Booth 50 is where these devices are present. 
We also started using a mobile diagnostic van that carries a mobile topographer, that carries a slit lamp photography system, a specular microscope to go to rural areas where these are not available to ensure that patients had access to these diagnostic devices. And the last thing that I'd like to speak to you is about all this information that we collect goes into creating something called a predictive model. And this is actually a predictive model that we've built for keratoplasty based on the last 25,000 plus corneal surgeries or, or uh, keratoplasties that have been done over 30 years. And you'll see that the most common type is penetrating keratoplasty. Most common indication actually was infection followed by endothelial keratoplasty. So utilizing this, once you input data about the patient, you actually will get a model that tells you what will be the predicted visual acuity of the patient at one month, whether the patient will come back for follow-up at one month, and what will be the predicted survival of the graft for that patient as well. Sure. So the advantage of this is the fact that your patient, you can identify if they're going to miss follow-up and ensure that you actually are clued in to their uh, outcomes and they're clued in as well. And we found that this has about an 80% uh, success from the perspective of prediction. So to summarize, it seems that remote examinations of the cornea do save time and also ensure that your patients are more connected to you. A good triad system will determine the urgency of visits, save time and money, uh, both for you as well as the patient. Smartphone-based imaging probably is the future of connecting with patients and also getting information. But it's also important to build collaborations with all our colleagues because they also will take care of patients remotely. And predictive models with the data that is collected is probably what is going to aid you in making better diagnosis and treatment decisions for our patients. Thank you so much. Thank you, Praveen. That was uh, really wonderful and eye-opener. Uh, one question to you, Praveen. Uh, legal point of view, uh, where do we stand if uh, we are opining or we are treating the patient on teleophthalmology? Is there something which uh, we, uh, we should be aware of that uh, how much we can go and treat uh, such kind of patient? Yeah, I think the Telemedicine Society of India guidelines are very clear there. They can say that you can provide teleconsultation only to a patient who is located in India. And ideally, it should be a follow-up patient. That's the reason why we're looking at follow-up patients rather than new patients. If it's a new patient, then the new patient should have a follow-up visit as a physical consult as a next visit. You can't use AI-based platforms to uh, give uh, uh, any treatment to the patient, but you can prescribe medicines online as well as they're within a narrow band of prescribed medicines. All our eye drops fall within that category, so we should be pretty good. Dr. Maskati, uh, the recent uh, circulation of all those uh, uh, guidelines which are going to kick in and uh, where the government is trying to put curbs on the remote consultation, uh, do you think, is there a role of us uh, as an EIOS to put it across to government that there are certain areas where we can still uh, do a teleconsultation and it still can be valid and it may not be as bad as they think. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 not that we uh, can, but it's something that we should do because if we don't put in our advocacy now, uh, these rules will be fossilized and then just like our AIS constitution bylaws, you won't be able to change forever. So this is the time that they've invited suggestions from the public, and I think AIS has already seized of the matter and is giving uh, inputs. We'll move on to the Thank next speaker due to already we are lacking time. And uh, the next speaker is none other than Dr. Namrata Sharma. Interestingly, I was thinking of what topic I should ask her to speak on because she's just about done everything recently also and updated. So I thought that one of the topics she could definitely update us upon is what's new in the management of fungal keratitis. Thank you, Somshila. Thank you for making me a part of this uh, important national symposium. And I would be talking to you about fungal keratitis. There are no uh, financial disclosures. I think uh, we all are aware that for our part of the world, it, it almost half of our cases are due to fungus. And that is the reason why it has become so important. And if you also see all the studies in the literature of late are on fungal keratitis because it is the most, one of the most recalcitrant uh, type of microbial keratitis. Uh, like, a, like we always emphasize, I think it is very important to know that geographically where you are located, I've put this only for India because I anticipate that uh, most of the delegates are from our country only. So if you are in the northwest India, it is aspergillus which becomes common. And if you are in southeast India, then it is 
fusarium which is common and after you have diagnosed a case of fungal keratitis by its classical features of uh, dry thick gray texture feathery margins satellite lesions endothelial plaques fixed hypopion or abscess uh, then it becomes important to investigate it uh, it has been shown in the various studies that at least three fourth of the times you can uh, pick up or differentiate clinically between viral, bacterial and fungal keratitis. But microbiology does remain the mainstay and there are some characteristics which we are all aware of such as dermatitis keratitis as is shown here and when it responds, the pigmentation is the first one to uh, go away. Fusarium which tends to actually have a very severe course and yeast which is relatively rare in our country. Now 10% KOH is something I think which we all uh, use. Uh, for uh, diagnosing uh, a case of fungal keratitis is easily available, inexpensive. We've also descri described the use of the smartphone uh, along with the uh, lab, uh, uh, lab microscope uh, for this, uh, where you can actually uh, take the slide, smear it with 10% uh, KOH and then put it onto your lab microscope and also put a, a smartphone on it and then click a picture so uh, you can actually zoom it and see those uh, filaments. Apart from this, the routinely what we do is subroach uh, dextrose agar without cyclohexamide. PCR is positive in 74% of the cases within 4 hours. Confuscan is something which is not available at all centers and I am told even the newer models are now not coming up. So we have to use whatever we have. And th these modalities become very important in cases of culture negative uh, deep fungal keratitis because then you have to resort to these modalities, especially when you're clinically suspecting that it is a case of fungal keratitis. We've published the use of spectral domain anterior segment OCT for fungal keratitis because that not only helps you to delineate, especially the posterior part of the abscess, but also helps you to know the activity by looking at the keratocytes, the area of necrosis, etc. You can also make out on the AS OCT the activity of the uh, fungal keratitis. Of course, classically, we do treat uh, fungal keratitis with 5% uh, with, with netamycin, which is given hourly during the daytime and too early at bedtime, which is tapered 4 to 7 days interval. And then generally, therapy lasts for 3 to 4 weeks in these cases. Fusarium keratitis, which has got resolved on topical netamycin. And because of the uh, poorly available, uh, poor bioavailability of these currently available antifungal agents, we've resorted to other um, uh, routes and other agents as well. Now, the MUT1 trial taught us that voriconazole should not be used as monotherapy in fil filamentous keratitis, but it did not look at into the additional role of voriconazole with natamycin in combination therapy. And classically, what has been taught is that for large, large ulcers, severe deep keratitis, keratitis, post PK, fungal keratitis, and endophthalmitis, you can give systemic antifungal agents. Uh, and of course, liver function tests have to be done after every two weeks. And this is an example of a case of topical, uh, which responded to topical natamycin and systemic ketoconazole. Now, the MUT2 trial, uh, again, uh, uh, did tell us that fusarium keratitis may benefit from the addition of oral voriconazole to topical netamycin, which means that it did not completely rule out the use of a systemic antifungal agent. And we did a randomized control study where we compared oral voriconazole with oral ketoconazole and found that the results in the, in the form of clinical response were similar, but the tear film concentration was better for voriconazole as compared to uh, ketoconazole. So if the patient can afford it, one can use systemic uh, voriconazole, perhaps that would be better. But if the patient can't afford it, even then systemic ketoconazole can be given. Like I said, the targeted drug delivery seems to be the uh, way to go. And uh, intracameral antifungals uh, are uh, given for cases not responsive to medical therapy with thick hypopion endothelial exudates and deep anterior chamber exudates and infotericin B, voriconazole and very lately we have also tried netasol which is the soluble form of netamycin as, uh, uh, as injection uh, for treatment as, uh, as a use in intracameral and intrastromal uh, uh, injections and this is a case uh, responding to intracameral infotericin B. Of course there may be problems in the form of uh, theoretical uh, secondary infection which at least I have not seen in any of the cases and intrastromal injections do help uh, as was classically described way back in 2008. And this study, if you look at, 
compared uh, topical versus intrastomal voriconazole as an adjunct to natamycin in recalcitrant fungal keratitis and where uh, it did show that topical natamycin and topical voriconazole were equivalent to topical natamycin and intrastomal voriconazole. So there is a role of adding uh, topical voriconazole to topical natamycin because uh, this was done in this study and these are just uh, cases uh, from uh, uh, from that that uh, study, uh, topical natamycin and intrastomal voriconazole, two sets of cases which respond and uh, I think this is not running anyway. Then uh, th this is what we published and I think this really has uh, benefited at least uh, our part of the, in our center we use topical systemic and targeted therapy protocol or the TST protocol, management algorithm for fungal keratitis. So if the ulcer is less than 5 millimeters in size, less than 50% stroma involvement, topical natamycin is given if there is no response at topical voriconazole. But if the ulcer is more than 5 millimeters in size, more than 50% involvement, systemic is given. Uh, and topical uh, is also given along with it. If there is no response, then you add topical voriconazole. And if there is no response after four weeks, intracameral or intrastromal or both, depending upon where your exudates are. And this was based on this study, a cohort of more than 200 uh, eyes, uh, sorry, yeah, more than 200 eyes to, uh, to uh, look at the efficacy of that uh, protocol. Now, this uh, is being marketed now by Microvision and all formalities are over and they're going to come into the market next month. So uh, natamycin 5% suspension has been linked to a polymer and converted into natasol in our ocular pharmacy lab. And uh, like I said, we patented it much earlier, but it, once you patent a uh, drug, then you also need to find market for it. And antifungal agents as such don't have a very large market as opposed to lubricants or as opposed to antibiotics. So uh, it took uh, some while to find an uh, industry partner for the same. Uh, this is how it is available in our center. We uh, formulate it ourselves in the ocular pharma pharm pharmacology department. And uh, topical uh, netasol 1% uh, uh, did, uh, did not show any toxicity studies which were done in the animals. Uh, this is single dose kinetics to show that if you compare it with natamycin, the peaks are actually higher and it stays for a longer period of time. And this is the same for the multi-dose kinetics where it was uh, uh, found to be superior to uh, natamycin uh, suspension. Now, this was the pilot study which was uh, published uh, regarding the determination of surgical outcomes with this uh, formulation in fungal keratitis and this is our RP center study because we wanted to look at intrastomal injections of voriconazole amphotericin B which we had earlier used and compare it with the soluble form of uh, natamycin that is netasol. So uh, this was uh, done in 60 eyes uh, in mild to moderate cases of uh, fungal keratitis and all the three groups were well matched. Aspergillus was uh, most common as is uh, expected in our part of the world. Repeat injections were given but uh, uh, we did not repeat more than four times and whenever required it was done after 72 hours and if you look at the mean size of the epithelial defect netasol did much better as compared to voriconazole and infotericin B and this was uh, found to be significantly statistically significant and uh, just to show that stromal infiltrates voriconazole did better than infotericin B and then netasol did better than infotericin B as well. Uh, this is the time to re which was uh, significantly different with intrastromal injections having faster resolution with uh, netasol and voriconazole as compared to with amphotericin B. And the uh, vascularization was not found to be significantly different both in terms of clock hours or in terms of the uh, depth of vascularization. Just to show some of the cases of intrastromal Netamycin, which is netasol, and it does cause uh, resolution of the uh, Dr. fungal keratitis. Yeah. So I think this is the classical case which was going for therapeutic PK, but which healed on intrastromal injections. And this is just to look at vascularization, which is maximum with amphotericin B and less with netamycin and voriconazole. And this is what we've already published and. This I want to highlight that despite therapeutic PK, you might still need intrastomal injections. 
So to conclude, uh, the uh, the healing of the corneal ulcer should be like this over a period of time, and uh, newer uh, newer targeted deliveries and newer uh, ways of uh, modulating the antifungal agents is the way to go for uh, fungal keratitis. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. I think we don't have time for questions. We'll move on to the next talk. Can we have the hall coordinators please flash the sign? That's what you're here for, or the hall volunteer. All right, so that these speakers know. Like I said, it's very difficult to see the timing. So you have to really flash it to us so we know. Okay, thank you. Next speaker is Dr. Himanshu Matali. Again, needs no introduction. And uh, he has a very interesting talk lined up for us, something new. Thank you very much, Dr. Namrata. Sorry, I had to No, no, it's okay. Actually, the timer should be Thank you. <coughs> and very good morning to one and all. I'm going to talk to you about uh, something very simple and yet very powerful, which is going to change our practice of especially dry eye and not just dry eye, many more things in uh, coming years. I do not have uh, any financial disclosure per se from my side, but yes, uh, from the institute side, we do have financial interest in the same thing. Uh, when we talk about uh, dry eye, uh, we, when, we, when we classify dry eye, when we treat dry eye, do we actually look at the root cause? Well, we do not look at the root cause. In fact, whatever the dry eye is, uh, we still put everything in the same bracket, dry eyes. Now think about it, can a dry eye with rheumatoid arthritis and melting eye be same as MGT just because their Schirmer's values and their BUT values are equal? Uh, of course not, we know that they are not uh, same disease, they are totally di different disease condition and hence uh, classifying them and treating them on the same banner would not be the best thing. Now same time we also know the tear film is a biomarker for many conditions from oncological conditions to many systemic diseases and in fact there are different disease taxonomy which are already existing where you can classify disease based on the cytokine levels which are present and not only that there are targeted treatment which are present and which we can use a targeted therapeutics to treat these condition when we talk about dry per se we have now knowledge and in fact there is plenty of literature available which shows us that with the dry disease uh, we find certain uh, cytokine levels which are abnormal and certain levels which actually increases and some of them decreases and with all these knowledge uh, we go next step ahead and think about can we just rely based on either clinical diagnosis, signs, symptoms and imaging modalities to treat dry eye. The idea behind this thing is, if you want to treat dry eye, well, you have to catch them early. What we do here, we, we treat the sign. I mean, in fact, dry eye treatment is, I, I call it a, a science of damage. We, you wait for damage to occur and then you say that, okay, now we are going to treat it. So why can't we have something where we can detect the, the dry eye much earlier, uh, we can treat them much earlier, we can have a targeted treatment and possibly we can prevent the further uh, progression and prevent the complication of uh, dry eye. Uh, so we do require some kind of biomarkers to detect all these kind of things. The biomarker has to be rapid, it has to be uh, quite uh, easy uh, to operate. Uh, it should be non-invasive test and hence TFM based. It should have multiple analytes so that it's not based on like one thing which we have like uh, MMP9 kit. Uh, it should have a quantification also and not just qualification positive negative kind of uh, thing. And uh, with that multi-marker strategy, uh, we, we come to a, a stage where we are looking at multifactorial etiology uh, with a great diagnostic power there and uh, more than one factor present. And this is what, what it brings to uh, what we call lab on chip. Now, uh, with uh, all such kind of thing, what we are trying to do is in within a short period of time, almost 90 minutes, we can get a uh, level of multiple cytokines which uh, we will have as a printout in our in front of us and uh, uh, 
this would not be just limited to, but at least including all these interleukin uh, 1, interleukin 10, uh, uh, TG, uh, TNF alpha, MMP9, VEGF, uh, many more uh, things to come in. And it's not just limited, it, 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 it can be expanded in any direction whenever we want. Uh, it's very simple. We use uh, Sherman strip, and again, we have validated and uh, reported all such kind of uh, things. And we we are quite sure about how to extract protein out of it and how to do the analysis. And after doing the simple Sherman test, uh, we uh, take these uh, strips uh, into sterile vials. Using a buffer solution, extract uh, uh, the cytokines and proteins out of it. Uh, we put it in a shaker uh, and which, uh, which sort of uh, enhances uh, this thing as you can see from here the shaker uh, would help us to uh, separate out uh, all these chemicals and uh, which uh, we take and finally put it in the wells. Uh, again as you can see there are multiple wells and the wells are connected to the channels which are pre-coated with antibodies and they are triplicated in the test. So test, it's not just one test, it's like three times repeated and you get an average out of it. And once uh, you get everything, you have the report in front of you. So as you can see from here, these microfluidic cartridges, they are coated with those antibodies and uh, uh, they, they are actually having a targeted analytes which uh, which ultimately shows us levels and not just uh, quanti qualitatively that present or absent kind of uh, thing. Few of uh, the cases uh, which we have done and uh, the interesting part here is the first, uh, all of them, the green one are, uh, uh, are, are the normals. The second one uh, are uh, subclinical inflammation, but they were classified as normal. And the third one were are dry eye. And you can see, even in those subclinical patient, the there was a significant amount of, this is logarithmic scale. So though it looks quite nearby, but there is significant amount of uh, difference there. And we could find that uh, there's huge amount of difference in uh, those patients. Uh, how does it matter? Well, clinically, let's take an example that one such case uh, where we checked the, uh, uh, the cytokine levels and we found that MMP9 were pretty high and uh, the patient uh, had an uh, uh, IPL treatment and post IPL treatment, the MMP9 levels reduced. Okay, okay, fine. Uh, the future direction uh, would be that once you do these uh, analytes and when you find out that you know what there are certain cases where the MMP9 levels were more then you can do a targeted treatment maybe like cyclosporine, trellos and those things. When we have ICAM levels which are high in future we will have lifetigrass then we can possibly treat those patients with lifetigrass. When we have multiple of them abnormal you might have to treat them more with uh, corticosteroids. The idea is if we are able to detect the root cause we can treat the root cause. Future would be to have a disease uh, stratification based on these levels and not just based on gross level of symptoms and signs and those things. We can have pre and post changes and hence we can follow up these cases much easily and we can possibly have a, a change in the molecular pattern and can have a very specific treatment which is uh, going to be a game changer there like to acknowledge uh, these people in our institute and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Himanshu. I think that I already know about the work, so if I appeared to be doing something else, that's because I've seen the work, but I hope it was a revelation to at least some of the audience here. And it's something very exciting and different that, that you've been doing. Uh, maybe we, we are going kind of okay with time, but don't get optimistic. Uh, can I invite uh, Radhika and Paras who are hiding there? They need to be here. And also the hall coordinator, the the timing, the timer now should be set for, the total time is 10 minutes. 10 minutes. So that means I believe you set it for 9 minutes. 10, 10 and 30. No, no, you set it even to, even lesser than that. Yeah, but he's, I, I was fine. Be, yeah, we're trying to be, you know, two steps ahead. So... Again, it's we so good that every speaker more. knows needs no introduction. So we go to one more speaker who literally needs no introduction. And if you don't know him, you don't deserve to be here. Sorry. Uh, uh, I am sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you, Shamshi Love, and good morning to all of you. Uh, I'll be sharing my uh, journey to Disek and Dimek from high volume surgeon perspective. I do not have any financial interest to disclose. I must acknowledge some of my friends, some good YouTube videos, and my daughter who believe that we live in the newness of small differences. So if you see the journey of EK as a whole is slow and tough. And 2011 and 12, that is the year where EK surpluses PK. And that is for quality of vision and quality of life and for long-term GURP survival. If you see the US data, 21 data is available with us. Gradually, DMAC is increasing. And in India, I believe that more than 100 surgeons are regularly doing EK in the form of DSEC or DMAC for last 10 to 18 years. And probably the number is between four to 6,000 per year. You see, I live in a place 25 year, kilometer from Kolkata airport. I do not have any formal training. We are private hospital and new Y bank and no cornea supply from other sources. EK journey was tough. But the only plus point, we have a huge patient pool and no other player in the state. So my journey started, I call it X Shuffer. Started in 2002 when I saw DILEC by Mark Terry. Then 2004, I saw the manual DSEC. Then uh, in 2005, I took a wet lab course, costly, yes, and only two picks, cornea and mentor was Mark Terry. I attended all the courses, everything, every possible way I want to learn that subject. I bought two artificial anterior chamber, one set of lamellar dissector by Millis, costly. In 2006, May to June, I started extensive wet lab, only with goat's cornea. Every day I used to use five goat's cornea with whole globe and rim, and I used to practice. No YouTube video that time, no free video website, no master class, no mentor, and no web nurse. This was my first case I did in July 2006. And unfortunately, the patient lost to follow up maybe after six months, but the patient did well with good vision. And it is a wrong selection of the case, first case, fake kick, young, and PPCD case. But this patient, surprisingly, after 16 years, come to visit me this year only in 22nd April. And the, you see the two eyes, whereas other eye was operated for PK, and you see the PK, Bula keratopathy, everything dissect in the left eye. And you see the, the uh, uh, dissect lamella, the first dissection was pretty good. And lower part of the cornea is still clear and the patient is having better vision still, 3 by 60 in the dissect eyes. So then I continued second, third, fourth, fifth, tenth, etc. And I used to start to show this in different small, small CME to get more referral. In 2006, I went to Las Vegas and interacted with uh, Terry and all attended all DSEC related symposium, watch all videos available at that time. So DSEC life was smoother than before. I got a lot of referral from Bengal, Bihar and Jharkhand. So indication, you know I am skipping this slide, but the only thing I want to share with it, this is India figure when I published and I see that we see a lot of FECD cases in our part of, uh, in West Bengal. It is almost 38% in now. So this is my DSEC manual preparation. I am skipping this all. Everyone have seen this several times. And my typical, I have never changed my technique to Busin Glide or other technique. These are my typical technique. One is the stack of old, another is 36 gauge needle. And I used to do even now when I do uh, uh, dissect in some of the cases. So manual dissect is going since 2006. Lot of so far I have done more than 1300. 
and it is going good in my hand and I know that it takes only few minutes uh, maybe in simple cases I can finish it it is a matter of practice and matter of your attitude towards your dissection we do have uh, um, uh, automated by only for patients demand to use those otherwise we are very happy with uh, this we published our result and it is always comparable to international series our endothelial cell loss is also similar so and if you see that this patient every year visited 15 years my third dissect post as cases and he is doing very good. Then DMEC. I did DMEC just, it is just accident. I tried in 2009. Then I got best video award, best paper award in that year. And there are huge failure. I uh, uh, attempted several times more failures. I gave up and I still went back to DSEC. And then I again all kind of wet lab, wet lab. And 2006 again I understand the procedure that whole dynamics of fluidics little bit of physics and the s mark and s mark make your life easy it is all you say that all good thing with s for successful surgery and we know that most two difficult hurdles of dissect is donor preparation and unfolding and of the scroll and in Western world, people get ready-made tissue and those are hugely expensive. In our country, we always, all surgeon prepare uh, DMEC uh, on, during their surgery. I have this simple instrument and I used to do the same procedure again and again. I am telling you donor damage is only 0.8% and I use those donor for DALC and dissect surgery in some of the cases so you all have seen in our courses i am skipping this the second this is the, the unfolding or unrolling this this configuration is very important and it is also i try to understand the different scroll size the tight scroll flat scroll no scroll reverse scroll different types and uh, we try to analyze that what is happening and DMEC unfolding is again most of the time I, I always tell my fellows and uh, colleagues that 60 to 70 percent time your DMEC uh, uh, roll or scroll will listen to you but other 25 percent time it will not listen to you then you have to think differently but I am not using any other method. My belief is if you stick to one particular method, you m can do it any difficult deep socket, high myopia. I use the same technique again and again. So unfolding is really is we published our data and the, uh, the vision is good, the endothelial cell loss is good and also the i started with dmac pd it was published and i believe that peripheral uh, donor count endothelial cell count is much more and my patients are this is typical example you see the right eye and left eye and there is a lot of difference and these patients are actually both eyes peripherally used you see the after four and five years the endothelial cell count is terrific we always enjoy this kind of we are also in COVID pandemic period, we have worked with different kind of tissue, some innovations, BCL contact lens. And we people had asked me, to, do you still do the DSEC? I said, yes, you see the data last six years, it is more than 1300 and you see that DMEC is close to 1000, but DSEC is also one third of that. So this is are no more difficult cases, I'll take just a minute so there are several uh, examples are there I realize this unless you have a quality robust eye bank you cannot deliver good EK service this is the graph of, of our eye bank pre COVID and you see the pre HCRP and post story so we have a tremendous jump in donor collection and utilization so 17 months DMEC learning lot of new things I have learned and at the age of 60 years and you, you know that it is every case will tell you something and 
Never try to be 100% perfect in DMAC procedure. You will, may lose that tissue. Take home message, in India, cataract surgery we are doing more than 6.5 million per year per day, per year. So we are actually producing a lot of PBK edema. And we are also having Fuchs dystrophy. Manual dissect is good, reproducible, least costly, affordable to common people in India. Because DMAC is manual. So we need to reinvent the wheel. We need not nowadays the expensive microkeratom because you will not get the service people who will give service to your microkeratom. We need more number of trained corneal surgeons with good incentives for them. At the same time, so we need more number of good corneas. I believe that if we develop eye bank within our own community, it is excellent. Needy patients are there. It is a matter of practice and attitude. Thank you very much for your patience hearing. Thank you, Dr. Basak. Uh, as usual, it was such an inspiring story. Uh, we'll move on uh, with uh, Professor Tityal. Uh, Professor Tityal is going to uh, talk to us about intraoperative imaging technology uh, for the corneal surgery. So, over to you, Dr. Tityal. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, friends. Indeed, uh, it's a real honor to be amongst the uh, cornea people sitting in this uh, hall because uh, things have changed so much in the last few decades. It's become a quite a you know, significantly glamorous uh, surgery in uh, ophthalmic area also. And when I uh, got a call from Dr. Somsila that uh, you have to speak on the intraoperative imaging, it was my delight. And thank you, Somsila, for inviting me for this particular uh, symposium. I think it is important to see uh, things clearly as Dr. Basak talked about. If you see, you imagine, then you can uh, implement that in your surgical scenario and you achieve the success in these cases. Intraoperative imaging was possible because of uh, OCT attachments. It can be handheld OCT uh, systems or the new microscope which has come with the OCT at attachment which will give you not only the imaging of the entire ocular structure of the host and donor, also will give you a dynamic uh, relationship between whatever you are doing at that particular stage into surgery and tells you the interaction of your surgical steps with the tissue interaction. That is a major uh, advantage of uh, intraoperative imaging, which will change your uh, attitude towards the surgical approach in that particular scenario. And this was a survey article we published, the review article in 2020. And mostly it were uh, most of our studies in that particular case. But uh, if you read this, you get a lot of insight into an entire gamut of anterior segment surgeries uh, based on IOCT microscopes. You all know IOC, uh, this attachment of OCT in the microscope was mainly supposed to be for retina surgeons. But now we realize it has a lot of uh, implication in for a corneal surgeons also. Now this is one scenario you are doing a lamellar keratoplasty and you are not sure if you have reached the depth. So this, if you can image this, you can always see how far you have reached, how deep, and how much you have to go subsequently to achieve the desired depth is very, very critical in these cases. Similarly, if you are doing an anterior lamellar keratoplasty, you need to know if you have removed the entire depth of a lesion or opacity, and that can only be possible by uh, scanning the uh, cornea with this OCT microscope. Because simple uh, operating microscope will never give you that analysis of uh, lesions which are present in a corneal stroma. And even you have a retro illumination, very difficult to pick up. Similarly, as Dr. Basak talked about uh, endothelial keratoplasty, there are many steps which may not be ideally visible. You may have to do so many things to uh, see that what has been done. Like in a cornea like this, the decimal scoring can be difficult sometimes. Even after scoring, I could see the decimal is still attached in some areas. So this will give you a guide. You have to re-enter and redo the entire decimal to access. In cases where you have a, such a difficult scarring happening and complicated pseudophagic patients. So this is one scenario we have all been talking. Is your graft well attached? Has it been attached quite comfortably despite putting air pressure for more than 10 minutes? And this is what uh, you can see that still after that the graft is not attached. You have an inter interface space still there. So this tells you you have to f do something more, maybe a staph incision, maybe a, there's a fluid. So this type of orientation which Dr. Basak talked about in EK with the DMEC is also is, this tool gives a lot of uh, visibility inside the anterior chamber. You know that what is the right orientation of your graft. 
So this IOCT is basically a surgical biopsy on the table, the in vivo optical biopsy, which gives you understanding of your diagnosis, which will be made uh, preoperatively by your examination straight lamp or anti-segment OCT. And it can change the planning of surgery on the table by monitoring the various steps. For anterior laminar keratoplasty, what we do, we do a scanning of the entire cornea first, see the depth of opacities. You can know the depth, uh, thickness of cornea also. Accordingly, you pick up the, if you are doing a micro assisted, you can pick up the right size of keratom head and de do the surgery in these cases. And achieving a clear, smooth surface is mandatory, and which is uh, possible with microkeratome. Both host and uh, donor can be nicely customized to fit into this, and subsequently you can do a, a sutureless surgery in these cases. In this case, I'm doing automated uh, microkeratome assisted uh, cutting of a corneal tissue of around 150 microns, and this tells you that your diseased tissue has come out. So that is the advantage you have and more importantly for a deep laminar keratoplasty it gives you a much more visibility. If you see here the entire desmets can be seen after you inject the air, desmet has fallen down to a anterior chamber. As you make a nick the desmets will come up and this tells you that your big bubble is completely filled and after completion of your suturing also you know that desmet is well attached, there is no double chamber which may be a possibility in these cases. So every step of a dial can be seen and you can mod modify your approach subsequently also. And uh, to summarize the anterior uh, approach with uh, visibility with a macrocarotome or surgical dissection, both pre-op, intra-op and post-op it is really handy, especially layer by layer dissection is becomes very very simple in these cases. What about endothelial keratoplasty, d cycle DMAC? Uh, we all know uh, you can prepare the donor tissue as Dr. Basak is so experienced. He can titrate the donor thickness by his manual dissection also. For uh, microkeratome, you can always think of uh, if you can achieve good in you know, one single pass, yes. But you can do a double pass technique and that can only be possible by uh, actually looking to the corneal thickness. And after you cut the tissue, this tells you that how much uh, you can do for this particular case. This single pass gives you around 100 micron thickness. The uniformity can also be seen. If you require, you can always take away the uh, another uh, cut from other side also. Host also, sometimes you know that in Indian scenario, the cornea can be so thick, mainly because of uh, epithelial hypertrophy. That can be picked up nicely. The scarring can be picked up. You can decide the uh, beyond the cornea also, looking for peripheral antisynechia, the pseudo condition, all can be seen. Intraoperatively, desperate scoring can be visualized and you can complete the scoring also. And this uh, sign we described uh, uh, with IOCT, if you have a graph ori orientation like this, the acute bevel sign, that means the individual site is correctly positioned in the, uh, in the uh, anterior chamber, then you, you are sure that uh, it can be done in an appropriate manner. Similarly, this study uh, is one of the, I, I consider a good study where we could titrate how much uh, intraocular pressure with air bubble to be injected, how long after putting a DSEC graft. So we did a case control study, looked for uh, three to eight minutes with uh, uh, intracameral pressure and superficial massage. We realized the graft gets attached within the first three minutes. So you don't have to wait for a 10, 12 minutes where you can have a compromised optic disc also. Apart from that, we realize you don't have to put a staff incision in your cases because interface is absolutely clear. There are no, uh, you can say, pockets. So these are very, very important aspects of uh, looking into these cases. The first important thing is to look the thickness of a donor cornea. Accordingly, you choose the uh, keratome head. And that will give you a nice cut subsequently. This is a, a Gibor microkeratome, which gives a very nice cut. After I remove this, you can see uh, how beautifully the donor tissue is. Normally, sometimes you have the peripheral area a little thicker and central a little thinner. But normal cut is around 10.5 millimeters. So you can always take 7.58 millimeter, which will be very, very smooth cut as such. And uh, you can take this into any uh, uh, technique. It can be a glide, it can be a faucet, it can be taco. But once you take this tissue inside, you can see I'll, I'll be pulling this. This is the uh, ILM forceps. Hold the tissue outside, nudge onto the incision side, then pull the graft inside gently. At this time, keep the infusion very, very slow. Otherwise, graft may fill up in the thin corneas. Then you can assess the what is happening inside. The graft is not folded yet. Increase the fluid graft will get unfolded and you subsequently you can see it is well attached. So this is the importance of seeing what is inside happening during your procedure. 
And imaging has uh, changed so much uh, in endothelial keratoplasty, DMAC or PDAC also. You can see a nice uh, correct orientation. Dr. Basak showed this is not a correct orientation. You just going to have to, you have to flip again. And this is a correct ori orientation subsequently. And you can complete the surgery without putting a stamp onto the, you know, uh, this very thin uh, uh, tissue. This is what uh, we have seen, we have published. This is Dr. Namrata Samal's paper. The DMAC in a hazy cornea is possible because as younger people will realize, uh, sometimes very difficult to see what is happening inside the role. People will jump into DSEC surgery, but experienced surgeons have gone to a, doing a DMAC uh, in all the difficult cases also. So this is to summarize, uh, intraop visibility makes really possible uh, all types of uh, endothelial keratoplasty, lamellar keratoplasty also. This is a work, again, uh, Dr. Namrata's work with the one thesis candidate, where actually this is the real advantage of uh, intraoperative imaging in pediatric cases, because you don't have a good assessment in pre-op conditions. On the table, you can assess these cases. It modifies your approach for surgery. You can have a better uh, diagnosis of these cases. You can summarize the, all the findings and change your surgical approach for these cases. So I would say pediatric cases, the intraop imaging is really, really important. If not IOCT, even a UBM will be helpful in these cases. The limitations are there with IOCT and that will be a future way to look into. Just to summarize, IOCT, if you have access, really changes the concept of a surgeon, the cornea surgeon in various aspects of surgery and diagnosis also, and achieving good results in these cases. Future would be to have a better uh, you can say co-optation of these uh, systems where you can have uh, intraoperative calibration to see the thickness, measure the volumetric analysis of these cases because just at present time the volumetric analysis is not possible with these microscopes. Sometimes the microscope, uh, you can say, uh, focusing and movement can be halted by, uh, by your OCT uh, imaging in these cases. But if you have now the access to a digital microscope, 3D microscopes with a larger viewing system, that also made uh, very easy uh, visibility of surgeon. You can see both OCT and microscope picture very, very clearly rather than looking through the ocular. Sometimes may give you a very hazy picture. Some assistant has to tell you from the Callisto image that what has been seen. So that is taken away by the digital 3D microscope now. Thank you for a kind listening. I think you have to see what is happening inside in your thoughts and that will translate into the microscope which has the OCT in the operation theatre. Thank you again. Thank you Dr. Titya. That was wonderful talk and I wish that we all have uh, such kind of devices which can guide us and thank you very much. Uh, uh, in future with the companies bringing down prices, I'm sure uh, this won't be a distant future that we all can have such devices. Thank you Dr. Titya. We'll move on uh, with our next uh, talk. Dr. Murli the Ramapa is going to uh, tell us about corneal surgery in pediatric corneal disease. What's new? Over to you, Dr. Murli. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Manshu. It gives me immense pleasure to be part of this symposium. In the interest of the time, None of the authors have any proprietary or commercial interest in any of the material discussed in this particular study. As we all know, one second. Yeah, to help stay on time, I thought I'll give a pre recorded version. Uh, I take immense pleasure, you know, this particular technique was innovated and pioneered at LV Prasada Institute. And uh, this work has uh, three components. I'm presenting a first component. The second component is the extended 10 years outcome study. And third is a prospective study. I shall be presenting our work titled Selective Endothelectomy in Peters and Amelie, acronym titled SEPA, the long-term clinical outcomes in 34 eyes of 28 children with Peters and Amelie. None of the authors have any proprietary or commercial interest in any of the material discussed in this particular study. As we all know, Peters anomaly is the most common anti-resegment developmental abnormality present with central or paracentral corneal opacification. It accounts for nearly 50% of the children born with corneal opacity. Bilaterality is seen in two-thirds of the cases. Incidentally, it is also one of the most common indications for a corneal transplantation among congenital corneal opacity. 
This is a typical case of type 1 petered anomaly with a posterior excavation, which is evident on an anterior segment OCT as well. In this particular instance, wider zone of cornea is involved. On UVM, you could actually see the perimeter of the corneal opacity having a synechial attachment, which is clearly evident on horizontal and vertical scans of the UVM. This is a typical case of keratoiridal lenticular dysgenesis, where right and left eye of the same child where left eye has a severe involvement with the cataract. While conservative approach applied in a milder variant of Peters anomaly, where a surgical interventions are typically reserved in a severe cases of Peters anomaly, often have an abysmally poor outcome. While small subset of milder Peters anomaly tend to spontaneously recover over a time, but majority may not show a discernible clearing owing to presence of anomalous layer as shown in this particular slide. Histopathologically, the posterior defect filled with a uveal tissue and anomalous fetal membrane as evidence in these histological slides. Perhaps uh, this particular layer inhibits the normal endothelial migration, thereby preventing the spontaneous recovery. Based on our clinical as well as histopathological observation, we felt there is a focal area of anomalous desmet endothelial complex underlying the posterior defect which perhaps serve as a contact inhibition. Once we remove those anomalous layer, the perilesional healthy endothelium tend to regenerate and fill the denuded area lead to the resolution of the corneal edema and also robust car remodeling in children together with overlying well-preserved anterior stroman architecture helps in the rehabilitative journey of a child. We documented the post-operative healing response after CIPA using high-resolution anterior segment OCT. At one month post-operative follow-up, DM is not only well opposed, the endothelium was covering the defect which is sharply demarcated. Together, clinically, we could actually perceive stroma is much more compact and transparent post-operatively. Our intent was to determine the functional success of CIPA in children with Peters anomaly. This was a single center retrospective consecutive interventional case series. The study included 34 eyes of 28 children with visually significant Peters anomaly that had undergone a selective endothelial removal with or without additional procedure. The study was conducted at LV Prasad Eye Institute, Hyderabad, India over a period of 8 years between 2012 and 20. Based on the location and extent of the corneal opacification, the corneal opacity can be categorized into the zone 1 which is a central island of corneal opacification within central 6 millimeter. Zone 2, central cornea with a peripheral cornea is involved. Zone 3A is a near total corneal opacification. Zone 3B, complete corneal opacification. This is a technique demonstrating selective endothelectomy. Step 1, severing the communication between iris and cornea. Step 2, identifying the actual defect. Third step, delicately removing the anomalous corneal endothelium without disturbing the integrity of Desmet's membrane. Step four, checking the integrity of Desmet's membrane. There was no Desmet detachment at the end of surgery. Type two Peters anomaly, wherein uh, additional lens aspiration along with sphincterotomy was considered in vivo of a large corneal opacity. The sequential picture collage of a milder variant of Peters anomaly, right and left eye of a same child showing the post-operative Corneal edema resolution with the scar remodeling as observed over 18 months period. In contrast to the top row, wherein had an extremely good outcome with a smaller zone of corneal involvement, the bottom two rows had a wider zone of corneal involvement that resulted in a suboptimal outcome following this intervention, which was observed over a period of six months' time. The sequential picture collage of severe Peter anomaly, top and bottom row showing a significant improvement in eyes with a smaller zone of corneal involvement compared to the middle two rows where corneal opacity is much larger along with a cataractus lens had a suboptimal outcome with a secondary glaucoma. Meaning even in a type 2 Peters abnormality with a smaller zone of corneal involvement can help achieve a good outcome. Primarily, our cohort included a type 1 abnormality, median age of surgery was 7.2 months and 85% had a discernible corneal clearance. So, the 97% had ambulatory revision and BCBA significantly improved 
owing to the resolution of the carnelo pacification on careful evaluation for the factors responsible for a sepa failure we found that one is severity of the disease the zone of involvement and additional intervention seems to be the important risk factor for the non resolution of the carnal edema 85% of the mild to moderate cases had a significant carnal clearing in comparison to the severe disease the cornea tend to clear even beyond 12 months so perhaps this may be related to the the remodeling ability of the younger children over the last 3 decades the literature primarily focus on anatomical success has shown a modest outcome and only 20 to 60% of them achieved a 2400 or a better vision at a median follow up of 4 years the current study where most cases have actually showed a significant improvement and vision is continue to improve over a period of time our study validates the long term outcome of sepa it's a novel less invasive surgical strategy for the treatment of virus in 85% of the cases opacity is significantly cleared with a marked improvement in the visual functions we have also demonstrated to the best of our knowledge for the first time that sepa can be used even in cases with the severe form of keratolenticular adhesion as long as the central carnal opacity no more than 7 mm or at least half of the peripheral cornea is remain clear the findings of our study questions the prevailing paradigm whether this procedure could be offered as a preferred surgical modality in every case of peter anamaly or only in a select cases where carnal opacity less than 7 mm irrespective of the type of peter anamaly the long term results are extremely promising can be a very effective surgical alternative to penetrating keratoplasty and this would benefit hundreds of children with uh, peters and amly related carnal blindness worldwide thank you for your kind attention i also thank uh, independent evaluator dr nikhil gokhale rishi swarup and uh, mandal they were uh, you know painstakingly went through all pictures pre and post operative and uh, evaluated you know the outcomes i uh, hoping our work actually ch- bring in paradigm change in the vb manager peters and amily thank you thank you for your kind attention thank you dr molita that was really wonderful uh, i think we'll just finish all the talks and then we'll uh, have questions uh, that's what uh, uh, dr somshila wanted so we'll go ahead and we'll abide to her uh, direct uh, next speaker uh, dr rishi swarup is going to talk to us uh, about the anterior level surgery what's new dr rishi Thank you, um, Himanshu, and at, at the outset, I'd like to thank Dr. Somshila for inviting me to be part of this prestigious national symposium on cornea. So, we uh, unfortunately there is not anything dramatically new in 2022 that we are doing in DALC um, because it's largely a technique-dependent surgery rather than instrument-dependent. Uh, but I'll just tell you what I am doing new. So, we all know the traditional indications for DALC are anything. which involves the stroma and the endothelium being healthy whether it's a scar or, or an irregularity of the shape or some sort of an infection in the confined to the stroma so we know that the duas layer is what is the separation plane where we remove the stroma and leave behind the duas layer desmes membrane and endothelium of the patient if the that's for deep lamellar keratoplasty if this opacity is superficial then you can uh, just do a partial thickness refination uh, either using a, um, a free handheld refine or if you have access to femtosecond laser or a micro keratome you can also uh, cut a, a kind of a 200 micron kind of a flap and remove that tissue and then replace with an equally sized um, tissue and this can either be sutured or you can even uh, apply it with a contact lens some people have used fibrin glue I'll stick to deep lamellar keratoplasty for most part of the talk because that is really the um, most important surgery. Um, important before you go ahead and plan the surgery is to look at the intraoperative OCT because that tells you how deep your um, pathology is and whether it's involving the duas layer desmes membrane complex. If it is, then you may want to do a pre-desmetic kind of a dissection rather than a desmetic dissection. so essentially the big bubble technique is a desmetic type of dalc and you may want to avoid that 
uh, if it's an ectasia of course you want to look at the extent of ectasia and uh, how thin the cornea is so that will help you in planning uh, your trephination etc there are several techniques of dialg the popular one being be the being the big bubble technique but there are several others and that's because uh, all techniques have some flaws and there is no perfect technique the big bubble technique involves introduction of either an air or a viscoelastic bubble in the pre duas layer space uh, which is a potential space and once you inject inflate this space it opens up to about 8 mm you see this uh, translucent kind of a bubble with a feathery uh, white ring after you remove the layer of stroma you can puncture the bubble uh, so this is called a brave slash you can put a drop of viscoelastic to make this uh, safer after that you can put in some viscoelastic in the interface ideally you should put a cohesive viscoelastic and then you go ahead and cut the uh, stromal La stroma in front of it with a scissor, a blunt tip scissor, and you can divide it into four pies and remove each of those stromal quadrants. Take the uh, uh, stromal button by removing the uh, desmes membrane endothelium, and then suture it in place. Femtosecond lasers uh, are certainly useful for deep lamellar keratoplasty because they help you give uh, uh, shaped cuts. So you would probably want to use a mushroom cut for most of your stromal pathologies. And um, because of the exact fit between the host and the donor, it kind of uh, fits like a manhole cover. So this is the second advantage is you can also get a, a make a channel to uh, introduce your big bubble cannula and uh, and um, reach the right depth with your cannula to get a higher success rate with a big bubble if you're planning to do that. So that's another advantage of using a femtosecond laser. But as such, cutting at the deep depth with femtosecond really doesn't help so much so rest of the surgery of course is the same and because the donor fits exactly in place the position is better and you get uh, probably get letter, less astigmatism as well intraoperative oct is probably the one new thing uh, which is uh, very very useful in a surgery like deep lamellar keratoplasty i borrowed this video from dr rajesh sinha you can see the needle going into the right plane there and then as he injects the bubble, you can see the desmes detaching, the desmes and dual layer detaching. You can see a ni nice big bubble. So you can be sure you've got a bubble. And as he's puncturing the bubble, you can see that desmes falling back. So, of course, in all steps, you can have a very good visualization, making the surgery much safer. And this was alluded to by the previous speaker, uh, Dr. Tetial. Uh, the problem with the big bubble is sometimes you don't get the ideal bubble, which is the type 1 bubble, and you end up with a water bubble like bubble called the type 2 bubble which is between the desmes membrane and the duas layer and if you try to open up this space then the desmes membrane is very fragile and can touch it can rupture on touch so that kind of uh, compromises your outcome but of course there are ways of managing that as well so if you have big bubble when should one do a manual dialg when you don't get a big bubble or if you are more comfortable doing a manual dialg, which is the case with me, I, I mostly do this. I use a specific technique, which I'll show you. Also, in very large and peripheral ectasias, the bubble doesn't go in that area. So it is useful to kind of go for a um, manual dialg. And of course, if you can't do a desmetic dialg, like a patient with an old high drops, then those cases certainly you must do a pre-desmetic manual dialg. Traditionally, we used to do a manual cut and peel technique in which you'd go layer by layer with a sharp instrument. But there's has a problem that you can end up with a perforation and also you can end up with an irregular bed um, also it is very skill dependent and that's why it's not so repeatable so we've devised this technique which i call the groove and peel technique in which you do a partial thickness refination and then you use a scissor to do kind of a scissor dissection underneath that refination edge and you go circularly and then keep spiraling deeper with each pass till at some point you will expose the shiny duas layer at this point, you can grasp that central island with the forceps and give counter traction at the uh, um, opposite edge. And using stretch forces, you can essentially open up that whole space. So same effect that you get with an air bubble, you can do with stretch. And because the stretch is distributed over a large surface area, the chance of perforation is much lesser. And uh, this is something new that I'm doing. I uh, had a scissor uh, device for this, which is, sorry, which has kind of made the procedure a little more predictable. Uh, basically, uh, this scissor has a thin, uh, a narrower and a flat profile tip, blunt tip. 
So it's very easy to introduce between the stromal lamellae, like so. Otherwise, it's like a universal scissor. And you can see once you've reached the correct plane. Yes. It peels off quite nicely like this. And you have a smooth bed just like you would get in a big bubble dalk. It's quite repeatable. I've done uh, lots of surgeries with this technique and results are good. You get a clean interface just like in a big bubble dalk. This is a patient with keratoglobus in which, again, it peels off quite nicely because the attachments are not so good. And similarly in therapeutic dalks because the stroma is spongy and edematous, this technique works very well. This was the same patient which got a good outcome. Uh, this is another patient who had a, a stem cell deficiency with um, a stromal scar and thinning which I managed at LV Prasad and we managed to give the patient a good outcome and uh, avoid amblyopia in this case. Perforations can happen with this technique also um, but uh, especially if you have a deep scar which is adherent to the dismiss so it's not free of complications but most of the time you can manage them quite well with good outcomes. So DALC is the gold standard for isolated stromal disease. Both big bubble and manual techniques work well. And if you, if you have complications, you can usually manage them and complete your DALC successfully. Thank you. Thank you, Rishi. And uh, I would like to thank all the speakers for finishing on time. We have five minutes of discussion. Uh, we would limit the discussion uh, by panelists first. And if we have time, then we might take one question from the audience. Uh, I would hand over to, to Dr. Radhika. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Himanshu. Uh, uh, Rishi, that uh, groove technique was uh, uh, really great. It's a groovy technique, I think it's become very popular all across the world. So my question is to Dr. Uh, uh, Murlidhar. So I never tire of you know uh, seeing those lovely images which show the uh, progression or rather regression of the edema and the clearing up of the cornea. So congrats to you on devising the technique and you know make it clear to the uh, rest of us. But my question to you, Dr. Murlidhar, is that uh, uh, you stay in the uh, uh, place with tripan blue to see that you've not created any DM detachments. But uh, how do you assess uh, the completeness of the endothelial uh, removal? Because like I uh, expressed to you in personal communication, I tried it for a couple of patients. So it was just the hands feel because visibility is also a little less in that area. So how would you know that when you're doing the removal that there is some semblance of uh, completion? Yeah, excellent question, madam. I generally use a red glow. The polishing is analogous to the way we polish the undersurface of the anterior lens capsule. So you would actually see the debris which you tend to clean. Only ensure that, you know, your aspirating instrument is a very fine one, new one. It doesn't have any rough or serrated edges that can actually nick up, you know. You may end up tearing the dismiss membrane. So this has to be very, you know, very, very good instruments. So if it tears, uh, like, does it actually work like DSO, like that's the uh, yes. DSO technique, which will still allow you to have a decent outcome? Yeah, excellent. There is a one, uh, you know, anecdotal publications of doing a desmetorexis. There are two, two things here. It may, you are creating a central regma. You end up having a regmatosinous DM detachment, which is similar to the regmatosinous RD. And second thing, because, you know, you don't have a desmet syndite complex, so it takes a longer time. So in my series, you know, within 30 days, I could, you know, serial OCT could tell me, at least it is a surrogate measure. Please don't take me if I have told OCT, help me to know the, you know, repopulation of endothelium. It's only a surrogate measure. At this, in, this point in time, unfortunately, we don't have any tie which actually measures or, you know, verifies there is a re-endothelialization. So that's the number one. And uh, the, the, the same author I've actually showed, it produced a significant scar. No doubt, you know, this endothelium laid down the new desmets membrane, which doesn't have that embryonic anterior basement, you know, ABZ. It's only PBZ. So that has a lot of scarring. So to avoid that scarring, you know, I just retaining the desmets membrane. So uh, I think if... Uh, there are no other questions. Uh, we may invite one question from the audience. If not, uh, then we conclude the session. Okay. Thank you very much, and uh, have a nice day, all of you. Over yeah. to you. The next session. You are invited for the quiz, which will follow right now in Hall B.